Uh, thank you very much, Nora, and thank you all for spending a uh, Thursday, at least the first part of the Thursday evening with me. Um, I know it's uh, a little bit, uh, I experienced it myself. My apologies for my tardiness. Hard to find parking around here. I didn't know where to park. That's not my area of campus. Um, so today, we're going to talk about preventing or delaying the onset of type 2 diabetes. Um, I'm a primary care doctor at Stanford. I do also some medical device research as well. Um, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I deal with it every day uh, in, in both uh, my personal life and my clinical life. Uh, I do have a little consulting arrangement with iHealth, which sells glucometers just to make you aware, aware of. Um, so today we're going to talk about epidemiology, uh, so how common the disease is, pathophysiology of diabetes itself, uh, how to diagnose uh, risk assessment, which I think is key um, for talking about preventing and delaying diabetes, uh, and then talking about nutrition and exercise. And as Nora mentioned, this is the first in a three-part series on diabetes, so I'm, I'm kind of attacking the, you know, before you get diabetes part. Uh, two of my colleagues will be talking about nutrition and diabetes and exercise and diabetes. So think about this as sort of the 101 kind of introduction to the topic. So I'm going to try to keep a very high-level overview, and definitely if you have more specific questions, uh, please ask them in the end. So one thing I want to have everybody do, since this is we're talking about diabetes, everybody stand up. Get the blood flowing. And you know, again, thanks for waiting. So this will get your blood flowing. So part of the reason when I give this talk, this is the second time I've given this talk, um, you know, guess activity is, of course, very key in uh, preventing and also treating diabetes. So you know, if you want to, you can jog in place, do some stretches, whatever you'd like to do. So take a minute, get the blood flowing, shake things out. You know. Okay, also there was a recent study, I think it was in Nature, or I forget which journal, showed that they thought that uh, standing longer was better for your telomeres. You had longer telomeres, which are, uh, you know, supposedly extends your life. But uh, please have a seat. So it's always a good way to start to talk about uh, diabetes, being a little bit more active. Um, so before we get started, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a clinician. I was going to add some slides about this, but uh, I, I didn't have a chance. I'm a clinician, and I, I see this from a physician's perspective, but also I am uh, at risk myself. So just to give you a little sense of my background, um, my mother's side all has diabetes. So my maternal grandmother uh, and grandfather uh, both had diabetes. They were actually both physicians. Um, my, uh, my mother is one of seven siblings and all seven of them have diabetes. So I'm at high risk for diabetes just purely because of my family uh, risk. So this is, again, you know, I, I think part of this is I'll be explaining from the patient's perspective as well. So I, I kind of know both sides of this issue. Uh, so something I'm worried about thinking about all the time, I think when I was younger, of course I was, you know, ah, it's, not a, it's, it's no big deal, I, it won't happen to me, but you know, as you get older, you, you realize, well, this, this um, is of concern. And of course, you know, I have two young kids now, and so that makes you really worried because of the complications about diabetes. So, uh, for, so I'll give you both perspectives. So does anybody know the significance of this number? It's a big number, not in, I guess, not relative to the national debt, but <laughs> big number, you know, in, in the medical setting. Uh, anybody know, take a guess? Number of diabetics in, in the United States, great. It's a big number, right? I mean, in terms of disease in the United States, it's one of the big diseases in the United States. So I'm gonna show you another number. So let's, what's, what's this number? Pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes, exactly. So that's an even bigger number, huge number. So this is, you know, this is a big problem. So this I, I, I stole from the CDC. They have a nice little sheet, lots of good, I'm not good at making graphics, so. I stole this from them. Uh, so again, 29.1 million, 29 million people with diabetes. And you know, they have this great way, one out of 11 people. So that's a lot. A lot of them are undiagnosed. So as you see here, one out of four, they don't know they have diabetes. They don't know. So these are based on epidemiologic studies, you know, sampling a, a broad a cross section of Americans and testing them and diagnosing their diabetes, and three of them knew one out of the four didn't know they had diabetes. And of the pre-diabetics, even bigger problem with awareness. 
nine out of 10 don't know they have prediabetes. So it's a big, big issue. So just, just the last half of that sheet was a little too long. I apologize if this is a little hard to see, but uh, the big thing I wanted to show here is that big number, the $245 billion. So that's, so that's actually pretty big compared to, I guess not to, compared to the national debt, but maybe our annual deficit. It's getting up there in order of magnitude. So total medical costs and lost work um, associated with diabetes, that's a big problem. And as you can see here, again, great graphics. They have blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, loss of toes, feet, or legs. This is what happens um, as in the end uh, as diabetes progresses in individual patients. So it's, it's, it has big problems resulting from diabetes. So. Again, big problem, 9% of the population, lots undiagnosed, leading cause of kidney failure, non-traumatic leg amputation, of course, major cause or contributor, it depends on how you want to phrase, uh, change the wording of heart disease and stroke. So these are all up-to-date numbers, National Diabetes Report from 2014. So why do you have diabetes? So again, this is an overview, so I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty and um, you know, there's a lot of detail in here. Uh, what is it? It's, well, it's hyperglycemia, which means high sugar. You have insulin resistance. And again, we're focusing on type 2 diabetes. I'm not talking today about type 1, which is something we used to call juvenile onset. And type 2, we used to call adult, adult onset um, uh, diabetes. But we focus on type 1 and type 2 now. Uh, so then you have a relative impairment in insulin secretion, um, relative um, to what they should have. Um, and you also have a strong association of type 2 diabetes with obesity and other re uh, insulin resistant states. So insulin comes from the pancreas. So a lot of people don't know where your pancreas is. So this is highlighted in yellow. Um, it's always nice in these pictures when you open up the human body, it doesn't look so neat. Uh, yellow is the pancreas, produces the uh, insulin. And there's a lot of other things going on we don't know. Uh, for example, when people get gastric bypasses where you take one part of the small intestine, rehook it up with the other, staple off the stomach, type 2 diabetes go goes away in the vast majority of people. So why does that happen? We don't know. So there's some other signaling going on there that we don't know. But again, this is the overview. So what happens in diabetics? Well, most of them, or many of them, are asymptomatic. This is why they don't know they have diabetes. They have no symptoms early on in the disease. Uh, when they are symptomatic, you can have, this is a lot of you may have heard, how oh, do you feel thirsty? You have to go to the bathroom a lot to urinate. So what we call polyuria, polydipsia. So polydipsia, drinking a lot, polyuria, urinating a lot. Um, so that can happen uh, frequently in people who have a symptomatic pr presentation. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a little less common. That's more common in type 1 diabetics. And there's something called a hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state. Most people don't have these super high sugars at presentation uh, to have this. It's, so it's much less common, but it can be very serious. So how do you diagnose diabetes? Well, it's, it's based on a lab test, basically. It's a simple, one of, the, uh, one of the, the diseases that's a little more straightforward to diagnose. So let's start with the middle column, because I think that's the one most of you are familiar with. So glucose is, we use glucose interchangeably with sugar. When we talk about sugar, glucose, glucose, the sugar we're talking about in the body is probably glucose. So let's, so when you hear me use, say, sugar, it's, I'm, I'm talking about glucose in particular. Uh, fasting, pla fasting plasma glucose, plasma blood, part of your blood. So that's kind of what you, most of you probably have heard about, or some of you have probably heard about uh, how you diagnose. So there are three categories that we've developed. So we used to only have two categories. We sort of had, well, you're, you're diabetic or you're not diabetic. And over the years, we, found, we created this additional category called pre-diabetes. So in diabetics, the fasting sugar, meaning typically eight, nine to 12 hours of fasting, typically in the morning, uh, 126 or above, typically on repeat measurements, of course. You know, one-time value may be a fluke. Um, Pre-diabetes would be from 100 to 125. And normal is 99 or below. So this is American Diabetes Association. This is fairly good consensus on the definition of diabetes. So let's go to the, this, the rightmost column, this column. So this is, we used to do this test quite more frequently, um, but now we don't do it so often. I think uh, people who've, been, uh, who've, who've had 
babies, been pregnant, uh, more recently have had to do this. So this is a test where they do your fasting blood sugar. They have you take a standardized 75 gram uh, or 75 milligram uh, dose of sugar. It's this syrupy little container they have. And then they make you come back two hours later and check your sugar. So for that, if it's 200 or above after you took, two hours after you took that uh, glucose solution, then you're considered to have diabetes. Uh, 140 to 9, 199 is considered prediabetes, and 139 or above, uh, uh, below, is considered normal. So then the last column, the leftmost column, is something called hemoglobin A1C. So this is a relatively, in terms of kind of the scale of diabetes, the t time span of diabetes, a new, a new thing, but it's been very helpful clinically and, and in the research setting as well. How many of you have heard of hemoglobin A1C? Okay, good, so that's good. So hemoglobin A1C is a type of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a constituent of your blood. Typically we, you know, familiar with it carrying your, the oxygen in your blood. So somebody clever found out that the higher your sugar is, the more a glucose molecule will stick to the hemoglobin. So then we call that, when the hemoglobin has a glucose attached, call it glycosylated hemoglobin. So then somebody clever figured out, hey, as a percentage, that is a very good estimate of your average sugar. So when they report, when they, we say 6.5, 5.7, that's a percent. So out of your, all your hemoglobin, what percent of that is glycosylated? So it kind of makes sense, right? If you had something in a sugar bath, you put a you know, hemoglobin in it, in it, the higher the glucose concentration, the more of that will get stuck uh, to the hemoglobin itself. So you know, over the past few years, I think about two years ago, they finally uh, finalized that and standardized the assay for hemoglobin A1C. And now we actually can diagnose diabetes based on the hemoglobin A1C. Previously, we just monitored progression and control with hemoglobin A1C, and only very recently uh, can we really diagnose diabetes based on this. So 6.5% or above diabetes, 5.7 to 6.4 prediabetes. Normal is, you know, less than that, of course. Um, so what is prediabetes? So as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of kind of an invented thing. It's not really a disease per se. So, you know, the, it, it's really a marker of risk. So when you have elevated sugar, it indicates, uh, but it's not in the diabetic range. We used to call it glucose intolerance. But now we know that really this puts you at risk uh, for developing di diabetes within five to 10 years. So it's, it's good, it's an awareness thing, it's a risk factor. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you will develop diabetes, but it means you're at high risk of developing diabetes within a shorter amount of time. So what are the risk factors for diabetes? We've talked about prediabetes. So why, you know, why would you, would one develop, what would put somebody at statistically higher risk of developing diabetes? Well, there's a big long list of things, probably most of them you would expect, right? High blood glucose, of course, that's the prediabetics. Uh, if you're overweight or obese, if you have a gestational diabetes, which is that uh, diabetes that we thought in the past wasn't, uh, wasn't thought to increase uh, diabetes risk, but now with additional studies, we know, now know it is a uh, risk factor for diabetes, uh, for type 2 diabetes. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, inactivity, smoking, unhealthy eating, of course, age, race, gender, family history, certain ethnic groups are at higher risk. So lots of risk factors. Um, so the, you know, I'm just showing you the whole sheet. I'll show you the uh, little easier to read version a little in, 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 a, in the next slide. Uh, this is a uh, risk sheet, and you guys can go online, AmericanDiabetes.org, and they have an online version. You can print it out and do the paper version. Um, and it's basically a nice test to determine your risk for diabetes. So there are seven questions. If you score five or higher, you're at elevated risk for diabetes. So let's go through the exercise. You guys ready? You need, I guess you keep it in your head or you can write it down. Okay, so this is, you know, it's a great thing. And again, if you don't want to do it now, you can go to um, diabetes.org to add up your score. So I'll do it for me because as I told you, I'm also a patient and I'm concerned about this. Uh, so first question, how old are you? So less than 40 years old. Unfortunately, not less than 40 anymore. 
So I'm 40 years old, uh, one point, so I get one point. Uh, are you a man or woman? Man, one point, so men are at higher risk than women. Uh, so I get two points. Uh, so obviously this doesn't apply to me, but if anybody's had gestational diabetes, uh, then it elevates their risk. So, so I've only got two points so far. Is it? Everybody got that? Okay, good. Okay. Tell me if I'm going too fast, if you didn't have a chance to add up your points. Um, do you have a mother, father, sister, brother with diabetes? Yes, for me. My mother has diabetes, so three points. Have you ever been diagnosed with high blood pressure? Not yet, so no. So no points for that. Are you physically active? Yes, uh, fortunately. Um, so no points for that for me. And then what is your weight status? So this is the part where maybe a little hard to read. Um, so looking at your weight, you know, as per your height. So you got to look up the, your, find your row for your height, and then look at your rate, weight. So obviously, if you're less than this range, then no points. If you're in this first column range, one point. This column range, two points. This column range, three points. So for me, I'm 5'10", about 200 pounds. So I get one point. So I got four points. So pretty close. Almost five, um, but pretty close. So if obviously if I, my weight goes up, if I get diagnosed with high blood pressure, um, I'll, I guess I'll never develop gestational diabetes, but um, uh, my risk, you know, I'd be in the high risk category. So I'm getting pretty close there. Obviously, you know, the cutoffs are somewhat arbitrary in terms of looking at the studies and the epidemiologic database. You know, why did they choose five as opposed to six? You could argue that, but so, you know, basically the, the higher the number, the worse, the higher the risk. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody want me to go back any slides to add up their numbers? No? Okay. Again, you can go to diabetes.org. They also have a toll-free number. Again, American Diabetes or Association, great organization, has done wonders for the uh, uh, research and, and, and community awareness of diabetes. So I hate to say the next slide, but, you know, no magic, unfortunately. I don't have a magic pill. If, you're, if you came here today looking for a panacea, I don't got it. Um, but what I do have is uh, some maybe spe more specific recommendations that some of you may not have heard. I bet many of you have heard them. But this is, you know, the overview is healthy diet, stay active, don't start smoking if you, if you haven't for the younger people, uh, stop smoking if you are, lose weight if you're overweight or obese, uh, and work with your doctor. You know, your doctor's your partner. Find a good doctor, somebody you're comfortable with. Uh, your doctor's your partner and can help you with these things. There's always different philosophical views in terms of how to do these things, but, you know, find somebody who you can work with. So let's start with nutrition. Um, so I'll take, have a few slides about nutrition, well, several slides. Um, but you know, it's pretty simple, you know, maybe fortunately or unfortunately. I know we, we try to make it very complicated. Um, I think, you know, leave it to a journalist to, to, to summarize it well. How, how many people have read Michael Pollan's books, Omnivore's Dilemma? Yeah, so he came up with this, this, this thing, which obviously is, he, he phrased it probably the best, but it's not necessarily his, his of course, not his original thought. Um, eat food, eat mostly plants, don't eat too much. Right. I mean, that's all the studies, nutritional studies, basically boil down to this. Eat mostly vegetables, non, non and you could say, well, non-starchy vegetables. Um, don't eat too much. And then I, this is my corollary. Eat a variety of foods. Get a different a variety. A lot of people tend to eat the same things, and it's easy to get into that rut of eating the same things. Uh, eating a variety of food is good for nutrition, but also just good for, good for the soul, good for you. Um, so a few practical tips before we get into the nitty-gritty, and again, the, the other talks in this series, one other talk we'll talk in great detail, uh, there'll be a nutritionist here as well as one of my colleagues, colleagues uh, about uh, nutrition and diabetes, but you know, a few practical tips, plan meals, use a grocery list, you know, cook at home, stock healthy foods, don't keep you know, junk food around, and don't shop hungry. So there's a few simple things to start with to load into your brain. Um, so this is the kind of the nitty gritty. So carbohydrates are, have kind of been the bane, and actually there's now even more awareness. Every, this, there's kind of a carb-free 
you know, carb, carb is evil uh, phase right now, which is a good thing, I think. I think there is a lot of support behind that. Um, so what are carbohydrates? So carbohydrates are basically sugar, starch, um, and fiber. I mean, that's the basic three big, big categories within carbohydrates. Um, sugar, of course, we're all familiar with. Added sugar, naturally occurring sugar, uh, starchy foods, you know, root vegetables, um, potatoes, peas, corn, lots of beans, and uh, of course, grain products, a lot of uh, starch there. Fiber is basically the indigestible part of plants. It's the part that you don't absorb. Um, it's kind of all lumped into fiber. So lots of you know, fruits, vegetables, beans, and grains, whole grains, of course, have a lot of fiber. So when you think about carbs, I always like to keep things a little simple. Think of them in these three basic categories. So you know, how do you learn about carbs? How do you know about what, what you're eating? Well, you, know, you can go to websites. If you cook your own food, great. Uh, you can look up each different constituent of what you make and, and figure out what's in it. Uh, but, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're busy. We, we buy things that have labels on them, nutrition labels. So it's good in the United States this is required. Uh, but, you know, it's helpful to know how to read a label. How do you read this nutrition label? Well, you know, to me, the key components to look at, the basic components, there's a lot of information there. Serving size, calories carbohydrates and fiber, and there's a lot of debate about fat now, so I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I won't get into that battle, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. Um, so this is, again, from the uh, FDA website. Uh, they have a great web page about how to read labels. Also, the ADA, diabetes.org website has information. You know, you start at the top. So important thing is serving size. So a lot of people look at calories, they jump to calories, and they don't realize, well, you've got to figure out What's a serving size? What are they saying? How many calories, the calories they report are per serving. All these things are per serving. So you have to make sure, geez, one serving is not, you know, a little tiny teaspoon. You know, it's 500 calories. So, you know, sometimes the, the companies can play tricks that way, right? They put this, make the serving size really small, and then it makes it seem like, geez, I'm not having that many calories. But you turn out you're eating 10, 10 servings of something is probably not a good thing. Um, so serving size is very important. And then you can see they'll, they, they're required to report how many servings are in one container, uh, so you don't have to do the math. Uh, check the calories. You know, the fat, again, people talk about sodium, things like that. Um, but, you know, for today, we're going to focus on the carbs and the calories and the fiber. So, you know, for example, in this one, serving size is one cup, 250 calories per serving. Um, and then you can see, again, percent daily value. It, it, we can get into those. They'll, I'm sure the nutritionists and the other talk will get into those details. But today we're going to talk about the uh, fiber, which you see here, sugar, and then carbohydrates you see here, 31 grams of carbohydrates. So as a subset of the carbohydrates, they break down the sugar and the fiber. Zero grams of fiber, five grams of sugar. So let me give you an example. So this is an example from my life. It was not a good day but I'll admit to it. Uh, so for breakfast, this is, I don't know, four, three, four, three, four months ago, uh, two boiled eggs, a slice of toast, glass of whole milk. Um, lunch, I had a bowl of ramen at a restaurant. Um, snack, I had a piece of small moon cake. Those things will kill you. Those are <laughs> high calorie, high fat, high everything, high sugar, um, but they taste good. Uh, dinner, I had a lot of rice, some spinach, some stir fried chicken, uh, had some grapes for dessert. So 2,000 calories, lots of carbs, 242 grams, and, you know, not a lot of fiber. So, you know, got to be careful about that. Um, so this was a good day. So again, just to give you an example of how different it could be. Same person, still me. Two cups of oatmeal, one cup of blueberries, a boiled egg. Oh, sorry, that should be one cup of oatmeal. Uh, Open-faced uh, turkey breast sandwich. So lettuce, tomato, slice of bread, uh, some walnuts for a snack, brown rice, some Napa cabbage and steamed salmon, a uh, cup of strawberries, and some Greek yogurt for dessert. Much fewer calories, 1,400 calories, much fewer carbs, and much higher fiber uh, intake. So, you know, just a quick, again, run through of how you could do that if you wanted to do it for yourself. There's lots of apps and in software programs, you could do it on paper too, whatever, whatever works for you. 
So everybody asks, well, so how many calories should I take? Well, how many carbs should I take, right? So, well, the calories, it kind of depends on how active you are, how tall you are, what your weight is, you know, all these factors. You know, um, to me, I think, well, if you want to lose weight, reducing calorie intake is important. Um, so you can think of it as a relative intake, you know. Whatever you're taking now and that your weight's stable and you, you're overweight or obese and you want to lose weight, you know, subtract from that. So you have a relative measure. You know, you don't have to worry so much about the absolute measure. I think a lot of people drive themselves crazy, you know, about, geez, 1,500 versus 1,700 versus 2,000. You know, there's a lot of details there. Well, if you're trying to lose weight, you know, think of it as a relative measure, not necessarily absolute. Because, frankly, studies have shown we are really horrible at estimating and we generally underestimate our calorie intake. Even with all the tools available, we, we tend to, and this is probably, there's probably psychological factors there. When given the choice between two things, we say, oh, yeah, we, we ate the one that has the lower calories, right? When you look something up, right, it's like, oh, there's two rices here. One of them has lower calories. Let me pick that one, right? <laughs> uh, human nature, yeah. Um, so how many carbs? Well, so this is one way, I, again, I'm going to, there are lots of different methods here. I'm going to just talk about carb counting method. So there's a, you know, different methods. You can have a plate, plate method where you have a plate and you look at how many vegetables, you know, what percent of your plate is vegetables, what percent of starches, what percent are the meats and proteins. Um, but, you know, for carbs, you can carb count, which is a popular method among diabetics and non-diabetics. So 15 grams of carbs is one serving. That's one, considered one serving of carbs. But you got to think about it as net carbs because remember the fiber is part of the uh, are part of the total carb. So if you eat a lot of high fiber things, you can actually subtract that out. So give yourself credit for those things. So net net carbs is total minus fiber because remember that's not absorbed. That those carbohydrates are not absorbed. Um, so you know, if, in terms of the diabetes guidelines, you, you'll hear argument about this. But you know, three or four net carbs per per meal, I think it's reasonable. I think most of us do end up on many meals taking a lot more than that because, you know, when you eat a plate of pasta, that's a lot of carbohydrates, pure, pure carbohydrates. So, you know, think about that. Again, it's a relative thing. If your sugar's high and you, you're, you're at three or four carbs already, you can still go down a little bit lower. And obviously, there are a lot of people now who are just going carb-free. Um, and it depends on your total calorie needs. If you, you know, have a high, if you're very active and you have a high total caloric need, you may need to have more carbs. So, you know, or if you're, you know, a runner, if you're competitive, you know, you people carb loading, so they may, you may need that extra energy. So it depends on the situation. So how much fibers? Well, the Institutes of Medicine um, did a review of the literature, and uh, they made, came up with these recommendations. So if you're 50 uh, or younger, and if you're a man, 38 grams of fiber, and uh, if you're a woman, 25. This is a lot. It's a lot of fiber. Most people don't get this much fiber. If you're over 50. I'm not, again, not sure, I, I didn't look at this uh, review, but uh, they recommended a little bit less, uh, probably because the total food intake is less. Uh, but let me just give you an example here. So from the two, kind of the good day, the example one was my bad day, uh, example two was my good day. So just to give you a summary, well, on the bad day, I had 2,071 calories, net carbs were 242, fiber was 4.8. On the good day, I did pretty well, 1,400 calories. Uh, probably below my caloric needs uh, if, you know, if I was active that day. Uh, net carbs, not too bad, 134, and 42 grams of fiber. And again, calories, well, what are the goals? Depends. Depends on how big you are. Depends on how active you are. Uh, net carbs, well, if you stick by the kind of three to four per meal, it would have been 135 to 180. So, you know, I kind of reached it for the good day. And for the fiber, you know, seemed like I did a good job there. So, you know, this is, again, broad strokes, broad strokes uh, here. So just to go through a few foods, I gave this talk, uh, I don't know, it was a month ago or something at a uh, uh, Chinese uh, or Asian health fair. So I apologize, the foods are a little bit more Asian-centric, but very common foods, obviously rice. So uh, the great thing is now, I wish, actually, I can show you. Ah, I forgot. So let me show you here. The great thing about Google, Google is just great, right? Uh, so let's see here. So you can put. So it doesn't. Even, you don't even have to go. Oh, you know. Actually, did I? Maybe it's not connecting. Oh no, it is connecting to the Stanford. 
Or maybe not. It says I'm connected. I haven't logged in a long time to Stanford uh, with my this computer. Well, I won't torture you with this. Basically, what happens is um, when you look at if you go to oh, there it goes. It's not doing that. Okay, well, we'll go back. So basically, I did a screen capture of what you see. So you don't have to go on any website. You just go to Google. You type in rice calories, and then this pops up on the side with all your search results. So you don't even have to go to the website. You can just, it just Google extracts this out from different sources. In this case, is Wiki, Wikipedia. So uh, just, again, just makes it so much easier now. It used to be, God, I remember when I was in medical school, it would be this thick book. You know, look, flip, 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 where we had the software that you know, was specially made. You got to look things up in, in categories. So it makes it so much easier now. Uh, and there are lots of different websites, but you know, I think most people use Google and you can look up these things pretty much instantly. So this is what comes up, even gives you a little picture. Um, so uh, amount per serving, so a cup of cooked rice. Remember, cooked rice. So with, when you talk about serving size, you have to think about cooked versus uncooked. Uh, in this case, it's cooked rice. Uh, 242 calories per cup, uh, 50, 53 grams of carbs in one cup. It's a lot. So one cup is not, not a lot of rice. You know, one little tiny cup is not, not a lot. Um, so, you know, this is, this is one example. So you can, again, look these things up very easily. Another example, I, again, typed in noodles, calories, and this is what pops up. Egg noodles, again, one cup. One cup of noodles is not a lot. If you ever tried this, I tried this once. I put a cup of noodles, uh, I put some spaghetti into a, to a cup, measuring cup, and I dumped it onto a plate. And it's like, there's nothing there. It's like, it looks like, looks like two bites of noodles, yeah. There's not a lot. And you can see, you know, 40 grams of carbs uh, for a cup of egg noodles. And, you know, you imagine when you go to a restaurant, right, you've got this big plate of spaghetti in front of you. You know, it's a lot. So it's, it's, you got to be aware of these things. Um, so... Um, uh, bok choy, so a, good, a couple of you know, healthy examples, I guess. Uh, one cup shredded, nine calories. I mean, vegetables, green leafy vegetables have such low calories. You can eat, really eat a lot of them and not have any problems. And again, for green leafy vegetables, most, most of the time, very, few, very low carbohydrate content and typically you know, proportionally high fiber content, even though you know, out of the total carbs, you can see half of it is fiber, even though the total carb is low. Um, so you can see, you know, Obviously, green leafy vegetables are very key. Nappy cabbage. So cabbage is a little bit more calories, but still not a lot. A cup of cooked, and this is cooked cabbage, so you know, it takes a lot of cabbage to cook down to one cup. Um, 13 calories, 2.4 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, so just a, a meat example. Um, I think this is from, I forget which website this is from. Um, you can see, you have to think about how you're cooking it. Uh, and when you look it up, you have to look, well, is it raw, is it roasted? You know, so you have to pick out which one, uh, how it was prepared. Uh, also, part of the chicken, part of the animal is important, too. As you can see here, you know, breast meat, you know, is better than, you know, wing meat, you know. Um, so, you know, and this is for an equivalent amount, 100 grams. So you can see that there's a pretty big range, even though it's all chicken. Um, so you've got to really be aware of what you're actually uh, which part of the animal and what, how you're preparing it. So let's talk about exercise. Well, any exercise is good. So people debate about this. How much exercise, how much exercise? Well, there are lots of recommendations. Any exercise is better than no exercise. So increasing exercise is always good. Uh, if you want to look at the ADA recommendations, it's 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise at least five days a week. This is pretty well evidence-based, but you'll see other studies talking about, geez, even five minutes of exercise is good. You know, 10 minutes of exercise is good. Depends on what an end point is. Uh, you can also total 150. If you can't do it five days a week, you can do kind of less spread out and more concentrated, uh, but it should be at least spread out over three days. And uh, try not to go more than two days in a row without exercising. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, how intense? You know, a lot of people, when they're really enthusiastic and they start out with this, they go crazy. They just go and they just run till they're, you know, falling on the ground. You know, good guideline is talk, not sing. So exercise at the rate where you can speak, maybe not so comfortably, but you can't sing. Okay. 
Um, and strength training is important too. So weights, resistance training is important. Um, so, you know, there's aerobic exercise, exercise where you keep your heart rate up for a longer period of time, walking, jogging, swimming, you know, any type of cycling if you're, you know, if you're not coasting the whole way, uh, hiking, different examples of aerobic exercise. Anaerobic, most of the sports tend to be anaerobic because you're stopping and starting, stopping and starting. I guess, you know, I had one person, one patient tell me, well, it says, it depends on how you play tennis, you know. He's like, I play tennis, it's an aerobic activity. So <laughs> that may be the case. Whoops, what happened there? Oh, it keeps trying to, I keep trying to join the Wi-Fi. Uh, here we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so strength training, what's strength training? Well, you know, calisthenics. Uh, resistance work, weight and weight machines, uh, other types of straight tra strength training, but they're, they're, those are the key points. Um, so losing weight. So, you know, we talked about exercise, talked about uh, diet, nutrition. So how do you lose weight? Because, you know, we talk about, well, being active, uh, you know, eating healthy, and then losing weight obviously is, it relies upon the nutrition and the, and, and the exercise. So, let me give you an example of just one, one point I wanted to drive home. So, you know, I, at my last time I, I had, so I had somebody uh, jog for me in place. So, you know, 30 minutes of jogging in place is about 272 calories. You know, that's how much you burn. So 16 ounce Jamba juice, or like for now, you know, I have a eight ounce, this is an eight ounce apple juice. It's 120 calories. So I can drink it in about a minute. 16 ounce Jamba Juice, you know, you can drink it about two minutes total, right? So it's about 300 calories. This is 120. So, you know, what's going to win? Well, you know, people always ask me this. Well, you know, I tell them, well, you got to lose weight. And myself included, it's hard to lose weight. And people say, well, I'm just going to be more active. Sure, you could lose weight by being more active. It's very difficult. If you look at the various clinical studies, uh, Weight loss with exercise alone is very challenging. And this is, this I personally think is why, and I've experienced this. You get hungry, you know, there's some snack there, you're thirsty, God, you want something a little sweet. It's hard to burn through that. So what's gonna win, you know? Well, the food's gonna win. So you really still cannot ignore uh, your dietary intake, your calorie intake. You still gotta pay attention, you gotta pay attention. Um, there are some people, there are rare individuals who can lose weight solely by they're able to keep everything else the same and they exercise more. Yes, you can lose weight that way, but for most people it's very challenging to do for this reason. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to lose weight, so this is just exemplary, this is my kid's leftover apple juice. So. <laughs> um, you know, how do you do it? Well, there are different ways. And again, this is just an overview. So what I'm doing now, I personally am using this app called MyFitnessPal. So it's got an easy way to look up uh, calories. You can actually scan barcodes. So I can, I can actually take this out now. Open up my app. And then, so I just add food. Yeah, they don't have the thing that plugs in. Otherwise, I can show you. But... So I don't know if any, I guess the guys in the front row can see, so. <laughs> so I can sort of scan, you know. So if, you're li if you don't want to enter it in, of course it's not gonna work on, on the day. Of course, the one I choose is not gonna work. <laughs> but on many foods it works. You can scan in the barcode. Actually, it's probably because I can't get the network connection. And then it'll give you the calorie intake, the calorie, and you don't have to enter anything in. I think it's because it it's not connecting to the network. So. so you do need to have a network connection for that to work. So for this app, you know, I ch track my calories. You know, I have a newer iPhone, so actually I don't even have any activity monitor. It just tracks my steps for me. So for example, today, 10,000 steps, active day for me. Uh, one floor I climbed, it was pretty flat, 4.5 miles. I went for a good walk today. So, you know, different ways you can track and, and keep track and use it for encouragement. But, you know, it's not, this is not, you know, you still have to do it, right? It's not, the apps and the gadgets don't make you lose weight. You are losing weight. You are being motivated. However you want to do it is something you have to figure out for yourself. But these are things now with, you know, our technology and being in Silicon Valley, 
you definitely can take advantage of if you find it helpful. If you don't find it helpful, don't use it. Um, so, you know, different apps, tracking your calories, tracking your activity, getting a scale, making sure you're weighing yourself. Once in a while, you don't have to weigh it every day. Uh, and, you know, you can also check your sugar. Some people are very motivated and they're pre-diabetics and they want to check your sugar. It's not necessary for pre-diabetics that you don't have to check your sugar at home. You can just check your sugar at the lab uh, with your doctor or at you know, events like this. It's not necessarily to have a glucometer. Uh, but you can if you want. If, you're that, if that helps you, if that's motivational, then by all means. So, you know, talking about behavioral change, God, it keeps doing this. Talking about behavioral change, well, you have to think, am I ready, you know? Well, first step is assessing risk. So we sort of did that at the beginning. So definitely, I encourage you to do that. Uh, are you ready, willing, and able to change? So don't fool yourself. Um, and then you've got to be very specific. So this is, again, suggestions. And I use this in my clinical practice, and I use this for myself as well. Uh, be very specific about what you want to do and make it realistic. Don't say, I'm going to lose 100 pounds. You know, say, I'm going to lose you know, 10 pounds in three months. Uh, and then how are you going to do that? So, for example, you know, here I said an example. For the next month, how long, uh, how often, four days a week, I will eat two pieces of fruit a day, one at breakfast and one as an afternoon snack. So very specific, realistic goals, something you can measure. Uh, this is not my goal. This is from the ADA website. But, uh, you know, for example, I set a goal for myself. I'd say, well, let me shoot for a net... 1,500 calorie intake, so meaning I could eat more than that, but I have to exercise down to 1,500 calories. A relative, again, it's not an absolute. Some people say, geez, 1,500 is so low. Um, and, you know, I set myself a goal of late, losing uh, 12 pounds within the next three months. So, um, and then I set myself specific sub-goals. I said, well, geez, every time at lunchtime and Nora sees me walking around, I walk around the parking lot, because we're in the same building. I'm walking around the parking lot, and that's how, actually, how I end up with 10,000 steps. Um, I'm walking around the parking lot for three, three, uh, 30 minutes, and you know, I ride my bike to work. So these are all specific goals. I said, well, geez, I'm not going to drive my car. I'm going to walk during lunch. I'm going to lose the weight, and I'm going to track my calorie intake and limit myself to a net calorie of 1,500. Uh, so a bad example is being general, and I hear this all the time. Oh, you're going to lose weight. Oh, I'll be healthier. I'm going to do a better job. Don't be vague. Don't make these broad statements. And again, did you succeed? Be measure it, something you can measure. And, you know, a little bit more specificity. Set few number of goals. I think too many people, you know, get lost in the details and set 10 goals at once, right? Set one or two primary goals, right? I want to lose weight. I want to be active, you know, one of them. Just pick one first, and then you can add on the second goal and add on the other goal. You know, be, if, you can't, if, if, you're not, if you can't achieve one goal, I don't see how you're going to achieve five goals that you set for yourself. It's just a practical thing. So write them down, you know, remind yourself about them. Uh, that can be very helpful. So, you know, in summary, this is, again, going back to that CDC sheet. And, uh, again, no magic here, no panacea. Uh, you can prevent or de delay diabetes, type 2 diabetes, losing weight if you're overweight or obese, eating healthy, and being more active. And then definitely work with a health professional. Um, whether or not you have diabetes, I think that's very helpful. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I went a little bit late and over. So we open it up to questions. Okay. What is the glycemic index and how does it relate to your talk? So what is the, the question was, what is the glycemic index? So glycemic index is, is a, again, a, another way to measure carbs. So it's a high glycemic foods, um, again, starchy foods, another way of talking about it, discussing it. So again, like I said, there's a lot of different methods for doing that. They may talk about it in the nutrition talk. So glycemic index, you know, high glycemic index foods are the, again, Foods with higher starch, simpler, higher starches and sugars, uh, simpler, you know, either starch or simple uh, carbohydrates um, that can really raise your sugar very quickly. So that's the idea. They're, they're adding that idea that there are certain foods that can really raise your sugar very fast. And those are the high glycemic index foods. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, activity and being active. Uh, 
uh, as a way to prevent or delay uh, diabetes. Is it really because it will cause you to lose weight, or is there some other benefit? Uh, there's many other benefits to exercise other than, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the question was, I mentioned a lot about being active. Is it solely per for the purpose of losing weight, or are there other benefits? There are definitely many other benefits uh, for exercise. Uh, cardiovascular benefits, so you just, you just put your heart in better condition. Uh, there are, you know, lots of other benefits that increase your metabolic rate. Uh, you know, building muscle does that as well. Uh, so there are many, I mean, there's a whole litany of literature about how exercise is good for you. Uh, with almost any disease state, <laughs> exercise is good for you. Obviously, it should be something, you shouldn't overdo it, but definitely, even independent of exercise, if you're fit. They even looked at there's one study looked at people who are, this is not this is specifically for diabetes, looked at uh, the cardiovascular risk for people who are overweight uh, versus normal weight, and, but the overweight who are fit actually had lower cardiovascular rate risk than the people who are normal weight but out of shape. So, you know, it's not purely weight, so you can't just, uh, uh, you know, it's not just weight itself. Okay, but you know, for my talk, we're specifically talking about in the context if you're at risk, if you're pre-diabetic, or otherwise have other risk factors. Then definitely, if you're overweight or, or obese, losing weight is very helpful. Mm -hmm. is, the, is the boundary between pre-diabetic and diabetic a one-way door, or is it somehow back and forth? Given that you have these opportunities for you know, lowering weight and, and increasing exercise. So the question was, is, is the boundary between pre-diabetic and diabetic kind of once you get become diabetic, is that it? Uh, or can you kind of go backwards and sort of, you know, decrease and not be diabetic anymore? Well, I, I, that's kind of two-part uh, issues. I guess it's kind of a semantic and philosophical issue in a way. Uh, it depends on what you define as, you know, in terms of diabetes. Are you sort of like having cancer? You know, once you have cancer, you've had, you have cancer just in remission. Well, if you say that, then, you know, of course, you can say, well, once you're diagnosed with diabetes, you're always diabetic. It's just under control, right? But you can also say, well, when you've developed diabetes, well, now your numbers are better. You're pre-diabetic. I think that's fair. So it depends on kind of how you think about it. I think when they say things like, uh, you're a diabetic and you're always a diabetic and you're just control diabetic is because of the risk. So clearly that means because you were diabetic at some point, that means your risk of developing uncontrolled sugar in the future is much higher than people who have normal sugar. So I think you can think about that. So you could either think about it in terms of, well, yes, uh, you can control it, or yes, you can become kind of a pre-diabetic and not have diabetes. So either way is fair, I think. If you talk about it in terms of the control versus not control model, absolutely, I have patients who lose weight, active exercise, and they're able to get off medications, they, their sugars become normal. Uh, this is very, very uncommon uh, for many reasons. Uh, I think one thing is catching it early is always helpful. Uh, so even before you, you know, again, part of the motivation for this talk, bef even before you develop diabetes, to become active uh, eat better, and then delay uh, the onset of pre-diabetes or even diabetes. So, yes, you can kind of go back and forth. Um, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah, I have a problem with lumping all carbohydrates together as one number, one feature. Uh, the, I mean, if you compare white sugar, let's say, to spinach, and both are, carbo are high in carbohydrates, my God, there's a huge difference, I think, there in terms of the impact on the body. Sure, sure. So absolutely. So uh, the question was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, should we lump carbohydrates all together? Well, carbohydrates are carbohydrates. So again, it's not, uh, you know, and I didn't mean, maybe I miscommunicated. I'm not meaning to lump them together. I'm saying that when you measure them and when you get these reports and you read labels, they're labeled as carbohydrates, right? So definitely you want to see... Um, you know, again, the total amount of carbohydrates, total amount of sugars, which the labels and, you know, the databases will tell you. So, and the amount of starch, absolutely. And this kind of leads to the glycemic index idea, where certain foods are high glycemic index, yes. But, you know, again, the, 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 the breadth of the talk is not meant to get into those details of that. So absolutely, um, you know, they're not the simpler the carbohydrates. You know, starch is basically one step away from sugar, even though it's considered a complex carbohydrate. Uh, the worse it is for your sugar levels, absolutely. Uh, but in terms of labeling, you have to be realistic and say, well, when, when I look up these things, they're lumped together. So, you, you know, to get the details, that's what I want you to be aware of. 
definitely certain foods. But also, if you look at the spinach or the, you know, like the bok choy example, you know, part of that does come out in labeling, right? Because one cup, if you look at the equivalent density of carbohydrates, one cup of bok choy, I forget, was like four grams, and then one cup of rice is, you know, whatever it was, you know, 35 grams. I can't remember what it was. So that still comes across even when you're lumping it together because you get an implied density by looking at the uh, serving size and the number of carbohydrates per that serving size. And for healthy foods like spinach, you know, cabbage, bok choy, those types of things, the, the, the carbohydrate density, even if you just all lump them together, it's still much lower uh, than other high glycemic index foods. Okay, sorry. Huh? Is, it just, I've got, sure. is it just as hard to go from uh, diabetic to pre-diabetic as pre-diabetic to normal? So the question was, is it just as hard to go from diabetic to pre-diabetic versus diabetic to normal? Um, I think it is, in my experience, I don't know, the, I don't know if that's been studied, uh, but in my experience, it tends to be harder to go, when you're higher the sugar it is, it's hard to get back even to the pre-diabetic range uh, for many patients. Uh, there are probably a lot of reasons for that, probably part of that's disease, part of that's behavioral. Um, so just in terms of my anecdotal feeling, that's the case. Uh -huh. What's the second question? I heard that there's a new meter on the market that measures A1C that you can buy in, in the drugstore. Are those, uh, except, you know, is that something you have an experience of? <coughs> sure. Yeah. yeah, so the question was, there's a hemoglobin A1C meter you can, you can buy, and is that, is that something we, you should buy or should use? So I'm actually, that's, that's my area. I'm a medical device. That's what I do my research in. So you're asking the right guy. Um, so I, I think it's fine to buy it if you want. Uh, most insurance will not cover it. It can be quite expensive. Um, I think in practical sense, you don't need to buy that because uh, hemoglobin A1C, really at most frequent, you check it every three months. So it's not going to be something you're going to be doing all the time. So the utility is probably fairly low for somebody to do that. Um, of course, if you know you don't have insurance, things like that, access to you know if you live in an area where it's difficult to access medical care, maybe a different matter. Um, so I would say generally I wouldn't recommend uh, doing that. I think the accuracy is reasonable uh, for the A1Cs. I, I forget off the top of my head what the range of accuracy for the uh, FDA approved uh, point of we call them point of care meters are uh, for the glucometers. Uh, it's around 15% plus or minus. It's quite a big range for the glucometer, so it can be a lot of variability for that. Okay, there's a question over there. <laughs> in the green. <laughs> green. Okay. Sorry if I'm picking in the wrong order. I can't keep track of who's asking first. <laughs> Exercise, seven different walking partners I have, Monday through Sunday. <laughs> and the whole thing is, I don't make appointments to go out for lunch with somebody. I make appointments to go for a walk. <laughs> so that's a nice way to do it. The other thing, question. You mentioned a book about diabetes. And I want to know the title of it. I couldn't get it written down. A book to read about diabetes stuff. Oh, no, so that's not about diabetes. That, uh, so the question is a book about diabetes. That was a book about eating, like, Food supply in America, yeah. Not about diet, it's more about the food supply in America, yeah. So, so he, he, yeah, he wrote several books. One was Omnivore's Dilemma, and there he wrote a couple other books more. Uh, so the first one, he, Michael Pollan, so you can look up Michael, P-O-L-L-A-N. Yeah, I think he lives in Berkeley. You could probably see him speak, yeah. Oh, sorry, actually, she, I think she was first. Yeah, go ahead. And, uh, so um, my question is, um, you know how sometimes your um, blood sugars can be high, um, related to something else, not diabetes, for instance, infection or whatever. Can you have elevated um, hemoglobin A1C that's not necessarily uh, a predictor of diabetes? Or like, could it be something else, like, like the way that high blood sugar is um, So the question was, so there are other states, such as when you have an infection, and for example, certain medications that can raise your sugar level, uh, can that also affect your A1C and raise it, and then, so you have elevated A1C and it may not be due to diabetes. I think those cases are, are usually pretty rare because usually those situations um, go away, uh, except for medications. 
So for one example is a steroid medication. Uh, steroids raise your sugar. So actually that's still just as bad. That's still, even though it's steroid induced diabetes, it's still diabetes. High sugar is still bad for your blood vessels. Typically infections, if they transiently raise your sugar, usually the infection becomes under control, uh, you know, or you get more sick. Uh, because typically the, for an infection to raise your sugar, it's usually a fairly severe infection. And chronic infections typically don't raise your sugar for a long period. Uh, kind of probably part of it's your body uh, adjusting to it. You know, we don't see you know, inordinately high sugars in most people with chronic uh, infections, chronic diseases like hepatitis C and things like that, uh, other than, you know, if they have diabetes. And again, uh, you know, if so I, so I think that's fairly unusual case. Uh, I think the more common case is the medications causing high sugars, in which case we're still very concerned about it. Do you think artificial sweeteners can help? Ah, can help? so, <laughs> yes, I, I know all about that study. So, <laughs> so, uh, so the question was, do, do artificial sweeten, do arti actually I was gonna put a slide about that, but, um, do artificial sweeteners help or hurt? So there was a study in kind of the most uh, famous, one of the most famous basic science journals called Nature, uh, I think a couple weeks ago. Uh, and then they looked at artificial sweeteners. They specifically looked at saccharin, aspartame, and I think one other. And so this is this interesting thing. This is a very clever study. So they gave mice um, artificial sweeteners. So they, in the charts in the study, they picked out saccharin in particular, but the, the effect apparently was consistent among with all the artificial sweeteners they studied. And they, so they gave this my, these mice this for a short amount of time, I think a few weeks, maybe six weeks. And they developed glucose intolerance. So they, their sugar was elevated. So they didn't have diabetes, but they have glucose intolerance. Uh, so their sugar was elevated above their control group. Uh, then they took the gut bacteria and they transplanted it to normal mice, so the mice who weren't fed artificial sweeteners, and they also developed glucose intolerance. So this is, there was, you know, when the first clinical studies came out, there was another study, I think by the same group, that looked at uh, patients who take in a lot of artificial sweeteners and then found out they had higher rates of glucose intolerance and diabetes and so forth. So th there was the thought when that study came out that this is a behavioral issue, right? People are drinking something and, and artificial sweeteners tend to taste sweeter to the human body than sugar itself. So the idea was, well, they're drinking this stuff, so they're kind of also hunting for other things and they're, they're having these other bad, it's encouraging other ba bad behaviors. So this study shows that maybe something is happening with your microbiome. Uh, and this is again a new, again, very hot area of research. Um, they also did look at the gut flora of humans who were fed artificial sweeteners. Um, I think they took healthy people and they found an alteration in the gut flora even after four days of eating of drinks with artificial sweeteners. Um, so yeah, it's something I have to say, you know, I, you know, of course the jury is still out and I hate to say this, but I've stopped drinking Diet Coke. So since that study came out, I've stopped drinking Diet Coke. I drink. I don't drink Coke. Yeah, yeah. Too high. The sugar again. My other slide about the hundred. Uh, a can of Coke is 120 calories. Most of it's sugar, right? And uh, you know, I don't want to be on my rowing machine for another, you know, t t 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I, I'm about 250 calories per 30 minutes on my rowing machine, so it's not worth it to me for that Coke. Maybe once in a blue moon. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we'll start with you. Is it easier to reverse? Um Insulin intolerance, glucose intolerance, or beta cell fatigue? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, is it easier to reverse, reverse, I guess maybe you meant insulin resistance? Yeah, insulin resistance versus, you know, kind of your pancreas, the beta cells pooping out and not, not producing as much insulin. Typically, classically, so this again has changed recently, and uh, I, I can't, I'm not claiming to be an expert on the, the, the literature in that, in that area by any means. Um, classically, you know, we have always thought that people with diabetes have insulin resistance first, and then over time, they, their beta cells kind of tire out and you produce less insulin. 
And I think clinically that's probably true because typically, you know, again, we start people in these oral medications, we transition to them, and like type 1 diabetics, they actually need a very little low insulin at first, um, some of them. Um, but, you know, there are these groups that, you know, and then they, they respond. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, don't, I have to say, I don't know, really know the answer to that question. I would say clinically, um, you know, it seems like if you take the bypass, gastric bypass, I kind of mentioned earlier that when you get a gastric bypass, right, your, your diabetes goes away within days, within days. We, at Stanford, they, even, they take them off all their insulin, most of their oral agents by discharge. They're like, you don't need them anymore. So that indicates, well, if there's still insulin resistance, because they're still, you know, obese at that time, they didn't lose a ton of weight in four days, um, that something else is happening with their insulin production. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's the jury's out. We don't, I, don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, who is, okay. Uh, which is more diagnostically uh, better, the A1C or your fasting blood glucose? Uh, so they're considered equivalent. There are some cases, so, sorry, the question was, which is diagnostically better, the A1C or the fasting glucose? So according to the ADA, they're considered the equivalent. So they, sometimes you do get, and this is a challenge because this is new that, you know, within two years that we can diagnose diabetes by hemoglobin A1C. Uh, we used to be told because the varying assays people use, we can't do that. Now they have a standard assay, so we can do that. But sometimes you get discordant results. So sometimes people's sugar is high, the A1C is normal. Sometimes people's sugar is low, A1C is or normal, and A1C is high. So, you know, uh, in terms of diagnosing diabetes, you can use either. So when they're discordant results, I personally, it depends on the situation. So if somebody has a very high A1C, like unequivocally a very high, and they have a normal sugar, they're probably still having a high average sugar. I mean, the a assay, again, is very, it's a very good, you know, idea. Unless, I mean, there's some things that confound the measurement, but it's a very good thing. So if there's very unequivocally high sh uh, A1C, it's probably still have diabetes, you know. Uh, the sugar is also, remember, just a spot measurement. It's a one-time measurement. So, you know, if the person went out and ran a mile before they had their blood sugar checked, maybe their blood sugar was a little bit lower. So, so I'm not saying that, well, I then value the A1C more, I still, you know, you've got to kind of think about the situation. You have to say, well, uh, you know, we don't typically see them both out of whack so far. So we don't see really a completely normal and a super high A1C. Usually we see, well, the sugar's, you know, 120, and then the A1C is 6.8. So then I'd say, well, you probably have diabetes then. So um, I think more often it happens you have inconsistencies with the pre-diabetic range because, again, it's a very much narrower target. Much, much narrower range there, so you, you see a lot of people of slightly elevated sugars, but their A1C is normal. So in that case, I would say, well, probably your sugar is just, that's probably a false positive for your sugar in terms of the pre-diabetes, because some people, if they fast too long, their liver starts producing sugar, which is how, one part of the way you maintain your sugar levels, and then to kind of you over fast and the sugar just becomes, the liver becomes active in the process called gluconeogenesis. So, so I guess the answer is it depends, but uh, I think if it's, you know, very skewed, then repeating the test is always helpful. Yeah. In the back there, yeah. How, do you recommend a high protein, no carbs at all, <laughs> no carbs at all, just fans, maybe fish uh, at all? So the question is, do I recommend a kind of protein-rich, uh, no-carb diet? So that's, again, very hot now. Um, you know, as long as you're careful about your eating, I think it's very easy with a high-protein diet to get too much fat, uh, not to get enough fiber. Um, so that's, that's one thing is that you may end up missing with a high-protein, no-carb diet is, you know, how do you get your fiber intake? Um, so, you know, I don't, definitely don't encourage it. I think if it works for some people, I think it's fine. It's hard to sustain a diet like that, you know. It's really hard to keep that up. So you have to be, if you do, a, do have that kind of diet, you need to be very, very careful and be vigilant. You're getting, making, making sure you're getting enough fiber and other nutrients in, in your food. Uh, because we really can't live on protein, pure protein alone. We're not uh, carnivores, yeah. You know, the paleo, well, paleo diet is a little different because paleo diet, you can still have carbs, right? 
So I, I know there are some people doing carb, no carb paleo diets. That's, that, that I wouldn't recommend. But uh, you know, paleo diet is more of kind of what were we eating when we were you know, you know, 10,000 years ago, right? What did we eat? Well, we still eat meat, but you know, we still hundred gathered you know, food. There, there are fruits and vegetables there. So that's not necessarily completely carb free. Um, so you know, I think paleo diet is fine. Uh, you know, if it works for you. I believe there's such a thing as uh, pancreatic exhaustion. Is that right? It doesn't produce much insulin? Yes, yes. So I think uh, one of the other uh, questioners asked about that. I yeah. a question. Uh, it seems to me that possibly the, the thing that triggers pancreatic exhaustion would be the high glycemic index foods because they're shooting it up and, and they have to the pancreas has to produce insulin immediately and they shoot it down again. And, and that, if that goes on frequently and a lot, that would seem to me be leading to pancreatic exhaustion. And so I think high glycemic foods are a real risk. Sure. So, so the question was about pancreatic, uh, kind of the, the pancreas kind of uh, uh, producing less insulin. Um, so definitely, that's, I think that's one model. I think it's probably more complicated than that. Um, I mean, part of the thing is what we see clinically is that people have high insulin resistance. So then the pancreas actually starts producing more and more. So the idea is it's more of a long-term exhaustion. Uh, and the insulin resistance may also be cause of that. So I think it's multifactorial. But it still doesn't explain the bypass patients who, you know, they still, they, they leave the hospital, you know, and they're, they're everything, you know, go, kind of goes back to normal. <laughs> so there's other things going on there that we just, I think we just don't know yet. Uh, I mean, the bypass is, is I mean, almost essentially we, we're starting to think of it as a cure for, Diabetes. I mean, there's so many people. I mean, it's like you know, 85 to 90 percent plus people who who basically have no diabetes uh, after their gastric bypass. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot we don't have, don't know. Um, I just want to know how much of a risk is it for, let's say, you eat late at night? It, does it affect? Uh, does it improve your risk of diabetes? Right. So there's this a lot of uh, people, uh, you know, ask about. You know, when do you eat, and you know, is there more fat storage and higher sugars? So, definitely, I think there is some evidence showing that eating uh, bigger meals in the morning uh, are probably better, and you probably have less uh, insulin resistance in the morning. So, eating bigger breakfast and more protein in the morning, uh, and eating at night. I think there is some evidence when you eat at night before you go to bed that that's probably not a great habit to have to eat big meals before you go to bed. And also, you know, the activity, right? Because you're not being active, so the, probably the energy gets stores away. So there's lots of ideas why that happens, but there's some evidence to support that, I think. Okay. What percentage of people with pre-diabetic syndrome go on to become diabetic? Um, so, you know, interesting. Yeah, actually, I don't know the absolute number. I know that, uh, you know, it probably triples your risk, triples or more your risk of diabetes, but I don't know what percentage. So it's a good question. I, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Huh? Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to ask you, when the people have the gastric bypass and then they're not diabetic, does it last? So yeah, so they've done study. So the question was, uh, does the gastric bypass effect persist? And actually persists. So there haven't been that many studies because the gastric bypass is you know, more recent in terms of when they've been studying it. So there was, I think, New England Journal and JAMA, uh, we reviewed it um, in, in, our, in our academic group. And um, you know, I think that was up to five year study and, and still pretty persistent uh, effect. Obviously, there are a few people who, you know, who, who, who uh, were lost, but it's fairly persistent in effect. So uh, you know, again, we don't know what's happening there. We don't know. Yeah. OK, one last question. There you go. <clears throat> Is there any connection between all of this and getting pancreatic cancer? Um, so yeah, so so uh, the question was: Is there any is there any connection between diabetes and pancreatic cancer? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, there are some of the drugs that are now being given for diabetes that that there's they're questioning may increase the risk of pancreatic cancer. So I think that has been of concern. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, but uh, as far as I know, the diabetes itself does not lead to an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. 